I am so delighted to have my talk to my friend Anna Cornblue about her new book, and hopefully this will stay up online for a long time, which would go against the trend that she's talking about. And so when you look at this, it won't be a new book anymore. I want to say before we start out that I'm a little bit in an ethical bind because not because we're such close friends and I don't feel like I could be objective, but no, because she attacks what I think is the greatest television show ever made, Better Call Saul. So I really had an ethical quandary. Like, can I actually help publicize this book that has a negative <laughs> thing about Better Call Saul? I'm just kidding. Uh, we, we can maybe get to that toward the end, but because it's comes yeah, somewhere more toward the end. <laughs> uh, and also, also a little pot shot at David Lynch. So that was a, that was a, also, right? These are not, they're not attacked. I think it's so interesting. People are so, so defensive, you know, yeah. like I've been to give talk versions of this at um, research universities where there are dignified scholars who like, they'd stand up and they can't even ask a question. They just say, but I love Fleabag. Like people are so defensive. It's not an attack on Better Call Saul. It's not an attack on Canal Fair or Fleabag or certainly not on David Lynch, right? It's an effort to sort of think through like the patterns that they belong to and to contextualize them among cultural forces. Like I'm not, people love a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about and I, <laughs> I'm, I'm just trying to understand it better. Like it's- Yeah, it's no, I know, I know. I was just kidding. I was totally in joke. I wasn't <laughs> kidding. I was just kidding. But let's, can, can we just talk to, to like sort of like what I'm, I'm really curious. So I, I think I told you this one time I had a, I have, I still have a folder. Like I have, I'm sure you have this too, like books that you're working on and thinking about. And so I have a folder and one of the folders is called immediacy book. And, <laughs> and I didn't tell you that. That's interesting. So I, I yeah. and, and what I love about this book is that it made that. So now I can just, the book never kind of, I just couldn't get it, you know, it's like, it just come, it, I've had it for like 12 years, that file or that folder. Yeah. And I just never could kind of get it together. And I had some stuff. And so finally, but I, I, I knew your book was coming out quite a while ago because I participated in this thing. Uh, I don't know, like, what was it like helping you get working on it or whatever yeah. at University yeah. of Illinois, Chicago yeah. uh, workshop. Right. And so, but once I, once that happened, I thought, well, I can now mine that folder for other like part of other and so actually part of it i just have a thing on alienation coming out part of that stuff is in there so i was very grateful to you for that because that was kind of a thing and, and then and i think what this book really really does is uh grasp the way that there's this I, I, I guess a cultural moment a societal like a societal move in a certain direction which i think is I want to ask you about how you started to think about it, That's, but I, I just want to give people a sense of like what it really, I think, incredibly does is get it both captures a cultural moment, but then also sees something that's in the fundamental trajectory of capital from the beginning. And I think people that have had questions about the book, I think, get kind of confused about how wait, it's one thing or it's the other but i think what you nicely show is that it's both things at the same time so maybe we can talk about that but i, I i'm not doing a good job of interviewing you because i really want i just want to say like what got you thinking about this was it your own aesthetic response to certain things was that and you're like wait a minute i go i want to follow my own response or was it more a theoretical thing like i I, I, I'm noticing something happening socially, and I want to think about that. Um, yeah, I like you framing the question that way. Um, and I do just, if I can peg, like, I totally want to hear about what was in your immediacy file. And, um, you know, and that sort of suggests, especially like the long time that you've been working on it and all the philosophical interests you have that, you know, immediacy is um, a topic for an interest of um, a desire of artists and philosophers, and also um, an, a motif for critique, right, and, a, and something that's a mistake, um, yeah. you know, in the history of philosophy and the history of thought about aesthetics. And so, like, there's a long, long kind of trajectory of people both trying to produce it and trying to sort of understand why that is um, fetishistic, reified, a, a mistake, an error, and so on. 
Um, and what I, so it's not that immediacy is new in the sense of the desire or the critique of it, right? right. To me, what's really interesting um, is that those longstanding um, kind of uh, formations and opportunities are colliding with um, in a very, very troublesome way, what the kind of real basis for economic value in the 21st century is in yeah. So um, we have- In a way they didn't um, before, yeah. you think. In a way in they a didn't way they before. Did. Right, no, I think so. I you mean, know what I'm saying? Like, so there's like, cycles. The, okay, good, sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, there, there, there are cycles, right? So um, if you think about, and, and to your point about, um, you know, there's some there are tendencies of capitalism as such that are towards immediation, right? Um, so what how does Marx give us the kind of formula of capital, right? It's M the money that goes through the commodity that comes back out as more money, right? A surplus value M to M prime. And he says very explicitly that the tendency and the compulsion even of capital is to elide that intervening phase of the commodity and to just sort of immanentize the valorization of money into more money. Right. Um, and so that is a, um, a, you know, a process of instantification. It's a process of immanentization, um, which he thinks is just a structural tendency of capital um, and which has to do with occluding the intervening middle or doing away with the medium in the middle. Um, so it's definitely like a long term capitalist right. uh, trajectory. And, you know, there are wonderful historians who have um, suggested that you can think about the, as it were, 300, 400 year history of capitalism as um, cycles that are more production intensive and cycles that are more circulation intensive or cycles that are more industrially intensive and cycles that are more financially intensive. And maybe cycle isn't the only way to think about that, but it's definitely true that as Marx you know, sets forth and then as kind of empirical history bears out in the um, leading capitalist economies in the world, that there are um, these kind of two parts of the valorization process, making things and exchanging them. And that sometimes it does seem that one of those parts is more dominant, maybe it's more dominant in certain geographic location, maybe it's more dominant in terms of how much profit is um, coming from it or what the kind of capital valorization or uh, stock valuation of firms that are committed to one or another is. And so um, circulation is always, you know, crucial to capitalism from the beginning, but I am trying to sort of talk about um, the intensification of circulation or the kind of um, real uh, squeezing of and, um, you know, rush to find value in the circulation process that the 21st century G7 economies find themselves in on the kind of end of, you know, 40 years or 50 years of secular stagnation, of declining rates of productivity, declining industrial investment, declining um, kind of uh, tech innovation. Um, so um, it is, you know, historically pegged that there's something going on with circulation in the 21st century. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what, that what's the key? The of, what's What's the key event for you? Is it gold standard or is it Reagan Thatcher? Or I, I mean, because I, you said like 40 or 50, like, you know, you're kind of approximating that time. And I wonder right. if for you, I guess for you, you would have to say like first there's the economic crisis and then there's this Reagan Thatcher response to it. Right. And as a Marxist, I assume that's what you would say. Right. I mean, I think that a lot of people, Brenner and so on, who are really invested in the hypothesis of stagnation, which is not just a Marxist hypothesis, you know, it is like a Larry right. Summers type um, right. kind of categorization, right? Um, that 1973 is the real pin there. And so that right. is end of Bretton Woods, but that is also um, oil crisis. That is also um, the Vietnam War and the kind of delegitimation of America imperial formation and it's um you know uh changing currency relations that knows right so um reagan and thatcher are um you know political uh disintermediates in that they want to take apart the state right there is no such right. thing as society they want to take apart the welfare state they want to subordinate uh the state to um the functioning of private accumulation um and so you can understand that deinstitutionalization and, and privatization of government um, as a certain form of immediation or of demediation. Right. Um, but I do think that there are um, economic uh, 
indicators, economic causes that are sort of precede that political formation of neoliberalism that do have to do right. with um, the expansion of the world market and um, the uh, kind of what is called a crisis of order capacity. But it's sort of like when you have this totalization of exchange um, and you have commodity society everywhere, uh, you know, there's only so long of raising the standards of living of people and of incorporating laborers into production before you reach a kind of limit that there's not going to be the same growth trajectory. And mm -hmm. because capital is always trying to demand greater and bigger and bigger growth, not just steady growth, but bigger and bigger growth, um, that really becomes a problem. So did you, to what extent are you a base superstructuralist? You know, because like, <laughs> like, you know, right. I, I mean, it's, I, I mean, there's a, it's interesting because I don't think you address this in the book directly, right? Like you don't, I mean, certainly there's some causality there, but my, my, I guess my question, because I think you're, I mean, I mean you're a, a Victorianist, right? And by training. So the, I think your belief is like someone like, someone like Georg Lukacs, right? Like that, that there, it, the art does have the capacity to mediate and respond differently to the, right conditions of the economic infrastructure, right? Like, so I think, right. I mean, you would say that, right? So I, I think you're not just, because at times I think, even in what you just said, it sort of sounds like, oh, wait a minute, are you just saying like there's certain economic things and then art is just, it's just like a like mirror of production, right? Like it's just, it's just right. like mirroring this productive process. But I, th I think you don't think that, right? Like you think art has this ability to give us some, to put it in order to, to give us some purchase on economic structure right yeah so this is a real dilemma you're getting to about the book and about marxist cultural theory so um you could call the book vulgar in the sense that it is an account of the too closeness or the too much determination of the superstructure of cultural aesthetics and of ideas by the base of, of circulation forward 21st century capitalism it seems to me that the dominant cultural style is not disclosing or mediating or revealing or taking critical distance from those conditions. It's just too, it's hewing too close. It's just replicating yeah. them. This is very sad to me. This is very problematic to me. I am a person who thinks in, as you say, the Lukashian way, but in the whole kind of history of Marxist interpretation of culture, there's always the possibility for aesthetics to take critical distance, to be inherently critical, to depart from, you know, the ordinary conditions and to sort of offer some um, ability to make sense of things, to offer some maps of the world that are, um, you know, important levers in transformation of the world, to um, operate some different regimes of values besides just <laughs> use value and surplus value, right? And um, I have written all of my other books about popular cultural objects, whether 19th century or 20th century or 21st right. century, that are, um, I think, are doing that critical work. And, you know, to go back also to your first question about, like, where did this book come from? Like, what is that to me is I don't see that critical faculty as really being very active right now in our dominant culture. I see it being actively rejected and repudiated, yeah. you know, whether it is um, in the kind of insistence that, like, we are, this is not art, right? I'm just giving you the true stuff. Yeah. Um, and therefore, kind of, you know, trying to, um, cut out representation, cut out mediation, and, and evacuate the possibility of that distance, whether it is in the kind of ecstasy of um, vibrating imminent presence and sort of like the just immensities of the moment yeah. that like, again, also seem to obviate like any kind of critical processing or distance, whether it is in the demand for like rapid uptake, direct message, total access, like one-to-one -one that, again, you know, uh, collapses, allies these kinds of frictions and dimensions that would require processing that would capacitate critique. So it is, somebody could say, oh, this is a vulgar book, or somebody could say, is there too yeah. much reflection there? And I think the problem that I have in the problem that made me want to write the book is like, oh, wow, there is just like not any distance in this art right now. And it's, and it thinks that that's a good thing. And so, really so, so what you would say is that the the it's not that you're a vulgar Marxist; it's the art itself has become vulgarized, right? Like in the sense, you know, I because I I want to 
I wonder if we could talk just for a minute. It's a little sidetracked, but I, 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 I'm curious maybe why you didn't talk about this in the book and maybe it had just been too, I mean, it's easy to imagine the book twice as long, right? And actually to tell you the truth, that's why I did it. Like, I just, I'm not, I'm just, I just don't know as much as you. And I could not read these novels by this, whatever, this Norwegian guy. I'm just not reading that. So I could never, this, the things that I don't like, I can't, I can't write on them. So I, I, that's why I couldn't do, that's why the book's unfinished. I just couldn't do it. So, but, and I think you do what, it's just an amazing job of like, really, I was joking about the Saul thing, but I mean, I think you, you really do a good job of like wading through things that you clearly don't, that don't appeal to you aesthetically. And I think that's a really hard, I think people don't recognize how hard that is to do without being just out, without being just pissed the whole time. So at least I find it <laughs> almost impossible. But I want to talk about 1999 because okay. I think 1999 is the, not just a year in the history of cinema. It is and not just a good year. I think it's the greatest yeah. year, right? And I know the you year. agree yeah. with this, right? It's the year. And you wrote a great, what I think is the, I just, I don't, it's not even opinion. I think it's the greatest book of Marxist film theory ever written. It's just a fact. I, don't think, I mean, it's a little self-serving because <laughs> it's in my series, but, uh, but I'm no longer editing the series. So it's, 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 I, it's, I'm not, and I don't benefit financially from it, but I, 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 I you should be able to run out and read it. Uh, but God, I think like this is in this epoch that you're talking about, right? Like post 73, whatever. And I think I'll, like I could probably name off the top of my head 30 films, and there's many more that do a pretty great job. And the ones that people know about the most are actually maybe they would not even make the top 30. Like, I don't think Matrix is even that great at doing what you're talking about. And yet it's the one everybody from 99 would talk about. I mean, Fight Club would be the top. But my God, there's Summer of Sam by there's Insider, which is incredible at doing what you're talking about. Right. I mean, you just have to bow down. So. So. So how do you what do you think? What do you make of that? Like, what do you make of was there? There clearly was a time when it was possible to do what like like. Those films are as every bit as good, I think, as Bleak House, right? To take uh-huh, the the, right. the, the right. apex of Dickens, right? So, right. so I don't. So, what happened? Is it just like phone and streaming? Because I'm tempted to almost be as vulgar as saying that, right? Like the mm-hmm. and you're pretty good. Like I heard you talking to somebody else, and they were talking about like the video store and how it's so much better than the streaming, which I totally agree with. I mean, I miss it so much. Uh, but is it that? Is it as simple as that? I mean, you're probably going to say no, but I want, I just am curious. And why you think that incredible, right. was that like the last hurrah of, of mediated yeah. art? And then it just, that was it. And then like, once you got to 2000, maybe there's a couple felt like maybe there's 2046 by Wong Kar Wai and, and right. Mulholland Drive. And that's about it. Right. Okay. So it's really important that you're talking about mass popular forms, right, that are mass cultural productions by industrial level producers, right? So, um, you know, these are studio films that most of the ones that, and part of what is so stunning about 1999 as that Annis is that these are major films and it, because it's a kind of apex of the, um, you know, trajectory of indie film prestige and indie film popularity with the smaller studios that are starting to get acquired by the bigger ones and so on across the course of the 90s and the whole art house indie thing and how innovative that is and then how much that expands what blockbusters are. Um, So I think that it is the case that there's something really special that's going on on the production side for studios in the late 90s that is not happening now. Okay, so why is that not happening now? So thing number one, if you want to go with streaming, would be um, that the whole kind of financial model for the industry has changed. And as I kind of try to account for it in the circulation chapter and in the video chapter, what has changed is that um, there is a divesting, a divesting and devaluing of the production of films, say, right? We're not paying writers as much. We are not um, kind of taking risks on or investing in interesting pilots or interesting first films or so on as much. We have um, consolidated corporately uh, the studios and the um, imprints and the brands. And um, there is instead this priority for the circulation of the films, 
right? Um, there is uh, distribution companies <laughs> being um, who are taking financial precedence. There is, and so that's why, for instance, it's so interesting that Soderbergh, you know, is kind of this, like distribution experiment for himself, yeah. I think. Um, and um, there are the old, the circulatory companies, they used to be the video stores, but the Netflix mm -hmm. has become, you know, kind of taken over the production function, but their imperative remains about circulation, about distribution, about streaming, about um, yeah. sending these things out in the world. And um, I think that that just changes where the value is in the in the production in the process mm -hmm. of cultural aesthetics. Um, so it to me it means that we do end up um, in the era of streaming with a, a kind of homogeneity of style, a kind of flatness of the texture of a lot of the original streaming content, um, a kind of or I call it even diluted, like that the stream is literally like in order to have this right. endless spigot. There's the kind of watering down, um, which has to do with things like, um, you know, plotlessness and cultivating what's called ambient kind of aesthetics, um, but also with uh, the kind of metastasizing of intellectual property, again, where the priority is like, how can we, you know, put the invest the least in the production of these things, but get them to go the furthest in terms of right. distribution, exchange, circulation, right? Um, and so that that's my issue with Better Call Saul, right, is that it's part of this sprawling right. universe of like Better Call Saul yeah. employee training videos, right? <laughs> right? Right, Not right. that it isn't like interesting in its own individual episodes. Um, and so I, th I think that the, the whole kind of um, financial basis of like visual culture has totally changed um, from, you know, there were multiple crashes that were really hard on Los Angeles and on um, kind of inventive production of films. Like they took dot com really hard in terms of there just being no like much less money available for spec scripts, much less money available for right. like, and I kind of knew this acutely because I was like writing my master's thesis and my PhD, like in coffee houses in Los Angeles with all these guys who were writing these <laughs> scripts or hustling to sell movies and right. suddenly like the money dried up, right? And that kind of right. dot com crush and then got worse after um 9-11 and then never did never really recovered and there was 2008. So I do think that when we're talking about um, mass cultural forms that there is this um as it were now like private equity driven <laughs> and kind of imperative to produce profit and consolidate the companies and circulation forward kind of whole um matrix of value which has really compromised you know our ability to have like a 1999 again i would say yeah. that yeah um that's not to say there aren't a few interesting critical films or like you right. know I'm sure you have a pick among the Oscars. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I think actually there's some a couple interesting ones, I think. But I but I, I don't I think you're if you look just at cinema and not at, at television, I think your point's irrefutable. It's irrefutable because there's just no I mean, we we I think we've went to two of the except two of the ones in the 2000s that are I think we saw Inside Man together and I think we saw Miami Vice together. And so. I don't. You didn't remember that. I think I one of them I had seen before. I think I had already seen Inside Man, or I can't remember. But we, mm -hmm. I, I went the second time with you. But uh, uh, and then I think all, Hillary, you and I went to Miami Vice. Uh, here, you were here for some reason. Uh, so, so I think there are exceptions. But, but Michael Mann is almost instructive. Because I don't know if you've seen the the Ferrari. It's a, it's, it's quite disappointing. I think, and yeah. and I wonder if it's like even he kind of succumbs to what you're, I mean, the biopic is maybe just, it's just always bad. And so it, that's the problem, but, uh, and he loves Ferraris too much. And that's also a problem. So, uh, so maybe it's something else, but, but I think, because he does have, like, I think black hat is a sort of is just a little masterpiece that doesn't get enough talked about. Oh, so, and that, that that's pretty recent. So I, I think it's probably just an anomaly and I think he's still probably good, but, uh, but, I mean, Spike Lee's trajectory is pretty revelatory too, right? Like it doesn't, like there's 25th hour, there's inside man, and then there's kind of like, it's very flat. So I I think it, and and it is interesting. Like what you're saying, I think is right. Like the, if you're, they, they will give money to a, a director they know that sells, but they don't, but they don't, there's no encouragement of like the new thing. And then those directors are encouraged to do, just regurgitate, what they've done in some other form. Like I, how many, how many 
television series are based on film. I mean, it's incredible. Like there's Lincoln Lawyer. There's I just saw that the Gentleman oh, yeah. by Guy Ritchie has now been turned mm-hmm. into a to a television series. So that's this constant just regurgitation of the. I mean, I don't know what to. That seems to me just exact species of what you're talking about. I want to though. So that I think I think that's abs- I think if you look at cinema, it's just what you're saying is just absolutely convincing. I think television. I might have some arguments about, but I, but I think cinema, I don't think there's, I don't think it's almost impossible to argue with you. I wonder though about, can I push a little bit onto a couple of Marxist questions? So mm-hmm. uh, I think, aren't you a little, and I don't mind this because as you know, you're much more of a Marxist than I am. So if I, if I'm, I'm like, if I'm, this is more Hegelian point, uh, but aren't you kind of saying or on the verge of saying that there's something in distribution that is actually there's a fecundity in distribution and i think that is a i think you're okay you're being very careful to say no they're just shrinking the time of of distribution right but couldn't it be that actually there's a little bit i don't know right of of like value is actually created in the act Mm -hmm. of distributing not just in and i think this would be of course heterodox for a Marxist, right? Because for the Marxist, it only can be in the act. There's this, as you point out, this like production of surplus value and then the realization of surplus value, right? And so there's no way surplus value can be produced outside of the act of producing the commodity. And I just wonder if you think, does what you're talking about maybe challenge that or you think it doesn't really challenge that? Okay, so I think that Marx himself um, says he calls this a double result. He does say it seems as if value does emerge from the circulation process also, and that you actually need both sides. He, you know, he is not really a labor theorist of value, right? Um, he is responding to and criticizing labor theorists of right. value um, because he's so interested in value as an abstraction and how does that abstraction get operated, right? I think it's 100% true in our, like, as it were, empirical reality that circulation has provided the main source of value. So we have this kind of production crisis, and what do we get? We get to exchange things faster, right? So if you understand um, the big business of the 21st century as um, all kinds of what they would call disintermediations, right, cutting out the middleman in order to have more fluid, uh, more flexible exchange, more instantaneous, more on-demand transfer of goods and services. You have logistics innovations that provide that. You have algorithmic innovations that provide that, right? So what is Uber but the kind of notion that instead of having a taxi company and medallions and all this licensing and these like cars that are essentially service and so on, like instead of having this apparatus of the taxi company, that you just have the individual consumer who just presses the, the you know the screen and their individual chauffeur shows up and that they get to have this kind of you know useful intimate direct relation and that the driver doesn't have to work when they don't want to work and they make their own schedule and all those kinds of things right so that there is this kind of um, you know uh, real resting of value from those kinds of innovations in exchange of services and in exchange of goods that has been the main source of profit and and and, uh growth right so um i don't and i don't think that's not marxist to point that out i think that what i'm trying to suggest and what the broader macro like marxist account of stagnation would suggest is that that's compensatory growth or that this squeezing of circulation this you know um overnight delivery or same day delivery or this just kind of rapidity of of um access to objects you know the stream itself and so on that that is um kind of covering over that there aren't new objects being made that there aren't great leaps forward and technological and microchip investment in, um and that there isn't a kind of um fordist compact in effect worldwide that enables the um producers of goods to also consume them and there's really just kind of limit to how expanded the world market can get Right. There's also a tendency to um, automate labor and therefore to expel labor from producing. And that produces a kind of or precipitates a kind of crisis for like, who are these workers who are expelled? Who how can they consume? And then then there's a demand problem. And then there's right. So um, I do think that 
there's value in circulation. And I do think that okay. Marx thinks that too. Um, I think that the in circulation intensivity of the 21st century has been a way to cover up the a production you know, problem. The, the yeah. production problem. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah that's and, good. you know, and then more to the point, I think that those values of instantaneity, fluidity, direct transfer, exchange guaranteed, that those values are just pretty apparently the values that our dominant aesthetics promote right now. Yeah, isn't it? I, I'll come to my other Marxist question in a second because you just made me think of this other thing. Like, don't you think it's odd that the vehicle, I wonder what you think of this. It seems very contradictory to me that the primary vehicle for immediacy is a, a form of absolute mediation. That is, the phone is just, a, it is a mediating apparatus, right? Like, yeah. that's, that's all it is, right? right? And so, it's what do you make of that? That that we everyone has become a and and what's interesting is I don't know if you have a theory if you how you think about this, but like the goggles that Apple's making now, or like uh -huh. my sense is they're gonna bust, right? They're gonna so there's some think, way, isn't there some way that the phone? I I think it's a like maybe the worst invention in human history. So, I mean maybe worse than the atom bomb, but um I think. If you count minds destroyed and not just lives, I think it is. I think it's hot, more damaged uh, than atom bomb. But uh, I, I do think that they hit a sweet spot, Jobs. Right? Like, like it's not too close, and you have to hold it and you have to keep checking it. So there is, there is this. There, this I wonder what you think about this. That this vehicle of immediacy, which I totally am with you on that. That it is media. It, it is like. Uh, obviously a mediating thing, right? And that you have to kind of pick it out and, and work with it and keep it at a distance. It's not just automatically right. on you. So isn't that a weird way that mediation and like maybe our even desire for mediation still is present mm -hmm. in the in the phone? I don't know. Maybe you don't think that. No, I think that's really interesting. So um, of course, immediacy itself is essentially mediated. That's Hegel, that's the, right, you right, know, right reason why it's a mistake that's why um uh that's what i'm trying to sort of exfoliate right like what are the mediations that cause this style right um right. if we have this aesthetic what it, what are actually some explanations for it that may be vulgar but it is a way of trying to connect it back to other forces and to sort of reveal that it's mediation i think your point like say the phone as contrasted with the watch or as contrasted with the goggles like my understanding is people find the goggles like nauseating and, you know, and also like uh, not so just great for their, you know, perceptual experience of phenomenal reality. Um, and I think you're totally right that the little bit of distance that the phone has vis-a-vis uh, -vis the goggles or something is an advantage of the phone. Um, and I think that people are aware of the phone as a tool and not just people who are as old as us. Um, so I think that that it, it, it and, you know, I think the place to land here is that it's not that technology in and of itself has a dispensation towards immediacy. And it's not that um, technology in and of itself has caused the crisis of production that we're in, nor the crisis of non-mediation that we're in, right? Um, I don't, I'm not trying to say like, oh, the internet ruined art. Like that is right, definitely right. not what the book is trying to say, right? right. Um, because I think technology is available for political determination and is the product of co right. contingent political um, kind of operations. Um, so, you know, is there a way to have like a critical relationship to your iPhone? Are there features of the iPhone that, you know, actually solicit or reveal their own mediations? Probably, yes, you know? Um, what do we, you know, think about like it's kind of battery life or it's fragile glass or yeah. um, that, you know, it's not just a magic palm because you have to charge it <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And because you can't lose it and because you need a case. Like, why do they only case it? You know, right. like, nice. <laughs> um, but I, but there is something about um, the kind of posture toward it and what you have to do to operate it that is not yet like. I just wish it and it comes, right? Right. You know, right. Um, I mean, maybe I can get Siri to order the Postmates for me. <laughs> I, but probably not, day, I, right? <laughs> probably not, you know, yeah. she doesn't have access to all the apps. 
Um, I, the other day I was running late to meet my husband and I was like a few minutes away and I said, Siri, text Ezra. And I, and, and she said, what do you want to say to Ezra Friedman? And I said, um, dear, you know, darling husband, uh, apologies, I'm running late. And Siri sent her a message that said, darling has been. <laughs> 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 that's incredible it's a little like have you seen us the jordan peele movie oh yeah yeah, yeah remember when she's like uh, call well i don't it's not called siri but whatever like call the police and then they play playing fuck the police <laughs> you know <laughs> so she can't she ends up being killed because she can't communicate okay. with the thing so yeah. yeah it's just great i mean i think that's really i mean i think people are obviously aware of that but i think I, I think it's unconscious, right? Like, I don't think that, I think that you, I think what you're, it's really interesting what you're getting at, because I think there's a, there's a, um, I guess, I, I, well, here's how I would have put this, like a conflict that you're getting at between our conscious plans and wishes and our unconscious desire. And I think what your book is so nicely showing is how our unconscious desire is remaining very dissatisfied by the, the, forced immediacy and then there are the but there are these but none, nonetheless that's our conscious wish that we're constant you know we think no we need it even more immediate because no one would think like oh i want my phone broken no i won't don't want siri to say the right message no one would ever consciously think that just like no one would right. you can't consciously slip right like you can't and no one would consciously want to have the dreams that they have so i think all these things like it, it's it's i think that conflict really subtends that's a word you would use, not me. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I have to say, I, I, can, can I just say that you write so different than me, but I love reading your books because it's just like, and it's, but it's when someone said, I was talking to someone, I think it was Paul Eisenstein who said this, uh, that it's like two like incredible long sentences with like really, like really complex language. And then just like, it, yeah, shit is very bad. Like some kind of like <laughs> really like machine gun shot at the end. So I really, I just have to say like stylistically, I have just such a great, oh. I don't know, admir I hate admiration as a quality because I think like if you admire something, try to be that thing. Don't just, but I, I have to say, I can't, I just could never do it. Like I just, I'm just too simple minded. I can't, I can't think that and write that way, but it's just, I find it so compelling. So I, I just, I mean, if people are reading, like it's just, it, it, and I think in a way, I think I heard you say this somewhere that the form of the book and that kind of, I mean, that that is really an attempt to fight against precisely the thing that you're diagnosing, right? Like it's the, right. it, I, it's interesting that you don't have any, I'm going to talk about a couple of people. You don't have any examples of your own life, right? I think it has to be intentional, right? Like there's no, oh there's no like, yeah. oh, Anna Corn, <laughs> like, oh, when I was a little girl, blah, blah, blah. So I wonder, you're, how do I put this? You're, 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 the, the theory thing was my favorite. Okay. So first of all, but you're a little strategic, right? Because you could have targeted some you could have targeted, let me just give you a person and she's dead. So we can talk really about her. You could have targeted Mari Rudy, right? Like Venus Envy has a lot of, per, like it begins with her own relation, like throwing Freud across the room when she saw the word, pe the term penis envy. And there's a lot of her own like upbringing and stuff. And so I, she, she's on it. I don't think she's mentioned once in the book. Right. Um, so w did you think about that at all? Like, were you trying to be like, I don't want to, or is there something different? This is an interesting question to me. Is there something different about what Mari does? Or, I mean, even say what I do, because I think I have some like personal stupid things in mind. So is there something, I mean, I, yeah. I'd i be fine okay. if it's like, no, no, it's like what that, that like, no, no, we can, we should be critical of that in, impulse in Mari too. But I wonder if you think there's some difference between that and say, uh, I don't know, like uh, Sarah Ahmed or something, right? Like living a feminist life. Right. Okay. So a couple of things. So um, to work in backwards order, there is not anything inherently immediatizing about presenting personal anecdotes or personal experience or piece or speaking personally, or about texturizing a philosophical argument with 
a, a childhood anecdote or a memory yeah, or something, yeah. like that, right? Um, in fact, quite the opposite. Like one of the things that Mari does that I think is so wonderful and certainly the key to her power, right, is like that she shifts levels back and forth all the time. She mm -hmm. really believes that philosophy and psychoanalysis can meaningfully enhance people's everyday lives. And so she has that possibility of moving back and forth between like an argument about Kierkegaard or an argument about Lacan or Derrida and or an argument about some great career theorist. And then um, like descriptions of everyday phenomenality, some of which happen in a personal idiom. Um, and that is, it's that frictive kind of moving back and forth mm. um, that I'm also trying to sort of perform in the style of the book, right? So when you yeah. say like there are two long sentences and then there's this like short one or yeah. when there's like a shift in registers from like, you know, Marxist theorizing to like a meme or something like I'm trying to produce that sensation of like, wait, where am I in this reading? Like, oh, these, this language is, um, you know, producing contradictions or it's not all seamless or it's not all homogenous or it's kind of like we just had a metalepsis or we just had like a shift or we just that to me those forms of um, juxtaposition those forms of contrast those forms of variation they amount to thickness I don't think they're only they're the only device for making thickness but they yeah. amount to something that impedes the kind of fluid transfer that immediacy kind of harkens right yeah so and um, I am not making an argument that there are no good novels in the first person. Yeah. You know, that is not yeah. what the book is about, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not even about the the problem of the first person in that chapter either, right? right? Um, it is about personalization as something that arises atop this void of nullified mediation. Um, yeah. And what is weird about, you know, contemporary first person fictions is not just that they're majority in the first person, which is a mutation in the history of those novels for three years, yeah. but that they have collapsed time horizons and they don't have characters and they have a demographic identity between the author and the protagonist. And they have, there are all these other things about them that make them different from some thicker first persons, I would say. So it's not like um, Mari has done a bad thing and then I have like partisanly not you know, accused her of it, right? I think yeah. she's actually done something very different than, um, you know, the kind of uh, style and also the goal of a number yeah. of these kind of auto-theoretical texts, for instance. Yeah, that's, I thought you would say that. I, I mean, that would be my position too, right? Like, I, I mean, isn't, isn't what you're saying, I just to translate into my own simple form, <laughs> like what you're saying is like for Mari, like the theoretical point is the driver and then the life like it's not just about revealing her life for the sake of revealing her right. life right and then right. i the really the yeah and i really like the way you're getting at this like it's almost like a like this encounter with the real right like you're going along you have this symbolic structure and then as a reader you're constantly hitting up against this thing that sort of shocks you it's like a dialectical shock right that takes place mm -hmm. i think that's really I think that you feel that when you're reading the book and I think that's really good. And I think that, I mean, I think that comes through in not just this book, but in the every book that you've written really. Uh, I want to talk, I want to, I want to touch on this first person thing though. So okay. I, I want to list a couple of first person novels and because I think, I think actually, um, so I think of myself as a modernist, right? Like I don't know what post, uh -huh. when people use the word postmodernism, I don't, I, I, like I, I think I reach for my, you know, I, I I release the catch of my Browning. Like I don't know what they're. I know you use it fine, <laughs> but I just don't know what they're talking about, right? And and so uh -huh. I, but I think of myself as a modern. Like that's the aesthetic. I'm a modernist. Like I like okay. you have kind of taught me to appreciate Charles Dickens, not George Eliot. I haven't made that. That's a leap too far <laughs> for me. Uh, but it's it was a, it was like a hard thing, right? So, uh, -huh. uh so. So like Gatsby, like 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 Gatsby, right? Like it's first person narrative. Like uh, Virginia Woolf was like first person narrative. Uh, Faulkner, whatever. <laughs> Sound of the Fury is four first person narrative, maybe three, and then one, whatever. So I I I wonder if I wonder what your relationship to modernism is, and is mm -hmm. modernism itself the first start falling down this hill? to what we have now. And I I, I just wonder if you, I, I guess I just wonder if you think that, because I I, I, I I almost think you, you sort of have to say yes, but maybe you're gonna say, say no. Okay, so 
you know, one way that you could tell that story would be that um, the modernist focus on consciousness and on perception um, and on uh, interiors of a certain kind um, and also then on fragmentation or individuation or atomization um, involves a rejection of the kind of omniscience that we see the realist pathology, right? Um, that you don't get Eliotian or Dickensian omniscience in James Joyce or in Virginia Woolf, right? Yeah. You get something different. And to the extent that that something different has a um, push towards the phenomenal and away from the anti-phenomenal abstraction of the omniscient or yeah. has a push towards the embodied, um, that it has a kind of concretization um, that might be setting us on the path to um, the immediacy style of anti mm -hmm. I think you could potentially argue that, but there are other features of modernist fiction that, you know, would counter that tendency, mm -hmm. right? So um, even if, you know, take Mrs. Dalloway, like even though um, there is this like, as it were, almost redaction of like the whole giant world and the war down to this like 130 pages or whatever, <laughs> 160 yeah. pages, like, um, that the the and the interest in consciousness and the interest in domesticity like that the whole way that the syntax of that book works and the whole way that it transitions among characters work and so on is this notion of the suffusion of the penetration of the interior by the exterior yeah. and that is still you know the war and empire and colonial administration and violence and bombs like all of that is just like in the like fabric of sewing your hem for the dress to get ready for the party, right? And yeah. um, so that is, um, it's not an immunitization, but it's like a different way of showing determination or dialecticity than the realist aesthetic. Um, but I think the, the bigger part of your question is like, is postmodernism something that it, that has yet another shift in that dialectical capacity of fiction? Mm -hmm. Because I do think modernist fiction is still dialectical and that realist okay. fiction is very dialectical. Um, and um, I don't even know that I think that postmodernism is the beginning of the downfall or something. Okay. Like yeah. That. yeah. Um, you know, I do, I think there's a lot of friction, juxtaposition, hybridity, heterogeneity, contrast, and above all, irony in postmodernism that are things that are radically not the aesthetics of immediacy, right? Sincerity right. and authenticity, not irony and the slippage of levels, smoothness rather than um, meta and descent and, you know, slipping um, heterogeneity rather than homogeneity, yeah. um, a kind of uh, what Jameson calls about postmodernism, a waning of affect like that, yeah. because, yeah. you know, there because there's all this meta and all this distancing and all this kind of, um, you know, sublimity that there's a certain kind of flatness and lack of yeah. feeling, but I think in immediacy there's a very strange waxing of affect, it's just right. intensity of right. feeling, um, that nonetheless has certain flattening effects. But yeah, um, so I think that I guess what I almost want to say is that immediacy feels to me like a different cultural style, um, because so again, it's not a slippery, it's not a slope coming from modernism to immediacy, okay. That's it's it. I mean, that's a break, you know, yeah, it's kind yeah. of a break. That, I, I, yeah, that's really good. Cause you know, that, that was my, I guess that was my point of most resistance, you know, because I, I, mm -hmm. I'm very, just, as I said, I'm very invested in modernist novel. And I think like there's, and what you see, your answer was just really good. Like, I think you're right about the, I mean, I, I do think that they're actually like the, that I think you could almost trace these little oppositions in like, are there moments where modernism is kind of headed down this alley? And then are there these other moments like you're talking about? Like, I think what you said about Dalloway is great. I think Jacob's Room is another novel that's kind of like that, right? Like there's so much that's not there that's there, that if that makes sense. Like, and so I think that that's, that does exactly what you're talking about. But then I kind of think Joyce, I think this is opposition between Wolf and Joyce. And I, I sort of think my feel, the reason I don't like Joyce is I feel like he's on this, he's put us on this path toward uh, it's kind of interestingly sexed too, uh, but yeah. to put us on this path toward what you're talking, I feel like, so I do think, 
I mean, even I'm sort of answering the question that really I don't, I, I didn't want you to answer, but I think that there is actually the problem with modernism. It does have this seed, I think, of mm-hmm. of this move, and I think you can see it in certain. I think in certain Faulkner, probably, in certain Hemingway, right? Like, I think you can see that too. I mean, not the great Hemingway, of course, but just in certain, like Old Man in the Sea, yeah. maybe, right? Like, isn't Old Man yeah. in the Sea already a kind of like? There's no story really. It's just about the mm-hmm. affect of this old guy and the, you know, and it's just, it's just pretty much, I know it was like really? the first time yeah. thing I read, I loved it. But it, like, if you're a real adult, you don't like to read Hold Man in the Sea, right? So, <laughs> uh, like, so, so I feel like that right. th- there are these modernist elements that sadly do point in, in the reason. direction that you're talking about. And and yeah. philosophically, it, I'm sorry to talk so much, but philosophically, don't you think it's interesting that, there's in modernist philosophy too, like you, you know, I don't think do you mention Bergson because like this whole vitalist tradition is like in the modern period right. is really right flourishing, right. right? So there that it seems like Bergson is like case A for what you're talking yeah. about, and these are all like neo Bergsonians, right? Like that yeah, we're, totally, that we're talking about, totally. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I had a really interesting conversation yesterday with this um, philosopher, um, Dave Marzella, and he was saying he's been thinking a lot about describing contemporary theory in terms of neo-phenomenologies. And I do think that there are, you know, trajectories of phenomenology that are about embodiment and the profundity and sort of immediability of um, the intensities of experience. Um, And... Um, you can certainly put the vitalists on that side a lot of the time, right? Yeah. Um, and this goes back to the question about like immediacy as like a propensity of philosophy or nation of philosophy. Um, and I think it, what I would almost want to say is like, you can find my non-dialectical thought at any point in the history of philosophy, right? right? Um, and it is a uh, struggle to maintain the dialectic, as it were, yeah. or there is actually a real difference between immanentist thought, vitalist thought, uh, effulgent corporeal plenitude thought, um, and um, the thought of contradiction. And that's yeah. not a negation and a thought of opacity. And I think that that real difference is, you know, okay, trans historical as it were, but that it has um, different um, economic and political salience in different moments. And to yeah. me right now, we live in an age that is trying to obviate contradiction, that is trying to cut out mediation, that is trying to, uh, you know, flatten and instantify and immanentize everything. Um, and that makes it like a non-dialectical age. And that makes me even more um, interested in being on the side of dialectics rather than on anti-dialectical philosophy. Right. And then the 20th century, I think you're right, that that was much more of, it was sort of fought out between phenomenology and dialectics or phenomenology and structuralism. And there, so there was this whole dialectics versus analytic philosophy, right? Like there, there's just, I mean, the one thing about it is that, I wonder what you think of this. It kind of reads, like you can read it in a very immediate way, right? Like I read it. So I was in, I, Hiller and I took a little trip to Maine, just pure vacation. I took your book along and I read it over the week. Like I read it in the car, and but I read it over the weekend, you know, in the whirlpool, in the jacuzzi, the freezing cold of Maine. So <laughs> I, I, and I, I, I have to say it kind of like, it, it's a pretty, I'm not, I'm not denigrating how hard it is because I think it's hard, but it's not, it kind of like, it's a, it reads almost like a novel. Like you kind of, you're sort of into it and there's a certain, I don't know, a flow to, <laughs> I'm saying words you don't like, so I, I, we have tried to be cautious, but I just, I have to say that it really, I, I found it just a, like, th- there's a kind of, I, again, I don't know what you think of this, but a kind of pleasure of reading it. And it's just so sort of, there was just, it just, it, it's odd because you're, it's almost the thing that you're criticizing, right? That, that it really kind of, you just, you're going along and cause, cause it, I don't know. You feel like that there's, how do I put this? You're, 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 you, the, the idea seems so powerful, right? That, it that, that, that you, you can see where you can you can see where the example is going to go, and I found that very, I don't know, I found that very appealing as a reader. Like I thought that it was really, you know, like they like 
you could sit down with it. You could say like, okay, we're going to dig into this thing. And then you, I think the other thing that you do, and I wonder what you, if you thought about this or that you kind of, I've heard you say before that like you were careful that you even made lists of things, right? And you do that, but you really, there's this interesting alternation between analysis of something, a couple pages, and then just like, oh, here's just a bunch of examples of the thing. So was that, I assume that was just totally conscious and intended, yes? Yeah, so, um, you know, the status of example is really hard when you're trying to propose a category that this has this much scope to it, right? Yeah. Um, and so it felt important to me to, like, get a lot of examples in. And then also you have to be convincing about some of the examples. So there is that, like, syncope diastole of, like, um, here's a whole chunk of things that, like, participate in this formation. That might be a list. It might be a lot of examples that are I'm sort of rushing through or I'm um, trying to squeeze in there, right, to sort of substantiate it. And then here's a page or here's three pages on one example so that we can kind of see how it happens in more detail. Um, and that was deliberate um it was also a very different way than i've ever worked like all of my other books are careful long readings of yeah. singular objects you know like a chapter on a novel or like the fight club book is almost this many words about one movie right like yeah. <laughs> um so i mean it's also about the history of ideas but the um so it was it gave me a lot of grief and then um uh you know how can i just you... interrupt you really quickly was that yeah, was that please. hard was that hard because i i remember the first time that i went from writing a book about with chapters on things to writing a book that just didn't have that to fall back on i i that caused me tremendous anxiety so i wonder if you could just say did, did was that okay for you or was that also for you like a that was like i'm really like yeah. making a step here in a different direction Right. I mean, I still had the crutch in three of the chapters that they're medium specific, except that they're about the problem of loss of media, <laughs> and, yeah, you know, yeah. of, of uh, medium collapse and medium unspecificity and indistinction. But, you know, like I knew which things eventually I knew which things belonged in the writing chapter as opposed to belonged in the video chapter. Right. Yeah. And that's some of an apparatus I borrow from Jameson, too, who has medium specific chapters in the postmodernism yeah. book and the chapter titles kind of go with that. But as an overall thing, like, did writing this book give me a lot of grief? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I was, I really enjoy trying to find words for something that I think is going on. And I really enjoy trying to find an explanation for what I thought was a lot of weird stuff happening in our culture. Um, but I, I was and am super worried about like, did I do it convincingly? Did I, did I, should I have had way fewer examples named and spent more time with mm. them? Or should I not mm. have done any, you know, long readings of things and just have right. like, here's all the things that they did. And, um, you know, and I read somebody complaining that um, my examples seem outdated. And it's like, dude, the, you know, publishing is slow. Like I finished <laughs> this book three years ago, you know? right, right, and right. it just takes a long time. There's paper supply chains, there's marketing timelines. There's like, you know, this is a fast um, press in the sense that it is, um, you know, has a big marketing apparatus and has like uh, a lot of presence, but it is slow because they don't have enough people <laughs> working there and because they're staging their, you know, schedule of things. And actually it was slower than university presses were. Right, right. So, um, you know, so like, yeah, I didn't write about a show that was on last year because the book was done three years ago. Right. I know. Um, I, 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 I remember when you finished it and, and like, and they kept pushing the date back for it, right? Like right. for whatever reason, right? Like presses just right. do that. Yeah. I think that's interesting. Like, I mean, it, it actually is to the point that you're making because, because I mean, that's about, like okay, you can't get the instant example. You can't get the you thing. Can. Yeah, and I, 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 Into I, the I, book medium. Yeah, no, I think that's pretty great. I want to just, I've two final things. So my first one is the Marxist question, then the last one, sort of a silly thing. Um, tendency of the rate of profit to fall, right? Uh -huh. Like that's a pretty. How much do you think your book stands or falls on that idea? And then do you think? I mean, that's a contested. So it's only in Capital Volume Three. There, there's, there's some feeling, I think, I don't think this is, you're, you're a better Marxist than me, so you'll know, you'll know the answer to this, but I think there's some feeling that Marx might have revised that out, and he had some second thoughts if he had published volume three, because it's published by Engels after, 
Mark's died. Uh, do you feel like your book rises or falls on that idea? And how convinced are you of that idea? So. Yeah, so there's the idea in theory, and then there's the idea in measurable indicators, right? And when I say this isn't just Marxist stuff, this is also Larry Summers. Like There are a wide variety of historians and economists who would grant the stagnation hypothesis, whether or not they grant the underlying hypothesis of what its causal factors are, they would grant that there has been attenuated growth in the G7 for, since the 1970s. That's a fair matter of empirical measure on a number of features, right? So it has indicators like stock buybacks. It has indicators like decreased number of um, and decreased frequency of stock exchange transactions. It has indicators in terms of industrial investment. Um, and it has indicators for labor, you know, about like responsabilization and um, kind of the taking on of debt and also, you know, structural unemployment. And um, and so those indicators, I don't think are in dispute. Like we have been in a, you know, 50 year period of stagnation in the G7 economies, and you can have graphs of that if you want. So it's empirically in evidence right now, whether or not that is, you know, explainable wholly by the long-term tendency, the rate of profit to fall is a different question. And I try to say like whether, I, I think that there is a moment in my favor, like whether or not this is true theoretically is true practically. Right I see, okay. And yeah. um, so, but I think the bigger issue is that, um, that theoretically speaking, that tendency is often yoked to the idea that capitalism will produce the seeds of its own downfall. Like that this kind of terminal crisis will prompt, you know, political transformation. And we don't seem to be in that yet. <laughs> um, and so I say like, you know, this um, immediacy of circulation, this intensification of the exchange process that is compensatory for the crisis and production process um, has not delivered a revolution. Right. right. Um, it has, uh, you know, there's been a right wing one, but, um, but it has, it, right. but it has delivered us, I think, something which is identifiable as a cultural formation that is different now than culture was in the 80s. Yeah, I think that's an interesting that you just snuck in there that little phrase. It's delivered us a right wing one, right? Like there, I think that there's a there's a whole other book to be written about what you're describing and the the development of right wing contemporary right wing populism yeah. right like i think that's yeah. it seems like that I that is a, that book. yeah i think it's it's pretty clear to me that that's really one of the things that's going on in response to this i mean it's both a, it's hard to i think you'd have to theorize it right like is it a response to what's happening or is it just a species of what's happening and or maybe it's both things at the same time so that's a that's a that's a that's a great question um uh i wonder about the style I really love the title. Uh, I mean, obviously, immediacy, whatever. It just had to be that. But the 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 too late capitalism. I want to know. Hillary and I were talking about it, and she's like, "Oh my God, I'd love to put that in the title of my thing." But she goes, "But now I can't because it's too, like, and it's the, it's too like spot on and great, and it just it's like too. It's not like uh, late capitalism or imperial. Like, it's just that I wonder if you fear this that it's like an Anna Corn blue. Like anytime you yeah, hear that okay. term, you're gonna say, "Oh, that's that's obviously this great term invented by Anna Corn blue." I wonder if you like how did first of all how did you come up with the term, and then okay. how did you like do you, like do you feel like it's a like I don't know what the like is it just like does it does it ha does it cling to you in a way that uh, you don't think it does? Okay. I hope not. I mean, yeah. the point of categorical thinking, the point of periodization claims, whether they're claims about um, transformations in the economic base or claims about ideological shifts, um, is to provide frameworks for thinking. Right. I want people to take immediacy and get inside it and drive it. You know, what does this do for you in your analysis of politics? What does this do for you in your analysis of analytic philosophy? What does it do for you in your analysis of like the, you know, medical industry? Like, um, and, so, you know, too late capitalism is the companion to that. Like, it yeah. is a kind of um, effort to name 
a structure of feeling, as an effort to name a um, period of ideology, as an effort to name um, a, a historical sense, right? The, the temporality of the present. Late capitalism has been a term of Marxist art <laughs> and right, other art right, um, right. for more than a hundred years, right? So like, what comes after late capitalism or does it just keep on being late, you know? Um, because the book is so much about extremization and intensification and exhaustion, I thought that too late was a, um, you know, kind of good colloquialism for this. Because you came up with it. Mediacy you came up with it. Yeah, I mean, I started using it in print about four, five, six years ago um, okay. in a piece that I wrote about the anniversary of Jameson's postmodernism, actually, that's in the oh. Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, I forget what year that is, but maybe 2019 or something. Um, and um, I just was looking for some way to indicate, like, things are the same, but they're also different. Right. We're still in late right. capitalism, but there's something else. When does the quantitative become the qualitative? If it's been late capitalism for 100 years, is it not something else now? Um, but I also think that the um, that it tags the ecological dimension, which is a kind of different limit to capitalism than the long term tendency of the rate of profit. Right, right. And um, I I think that there is a explanation, a symptomatic explanation, and I think not an adequate one, but of um, the rejection of mediation and the you know resigning of the tools of aesthetic representation as a kind of um, you know, response to extinction, like yeah. and to, to th the threat of extinction. Like, okay, what's the thing that makes human beings unique? It's that we make art. It's that we engage in abstraction. It's not that we have language, and it's not that we, um, you know, are smarter or something like that. And if we're gonna disappear, <laughs> then there seems to be this almost, pro you know, preemptive, like, well, let us not do the thing that makes us us. Um, and uh, you can find all kinds of poets and artists, kind of like literally making of claim and also saying things like well the eco side is so extreme or climate crisis is so profound that like who needs a metaphor there's no time for this we can't right, afford right. to build the media you know and so too late is a um you know a kind of ecological sentiment that i think is not um rising to the bar of political strategy yeah. Yeah, that's pretty great let's just let's let, that, that can be the mode of la fin because i think that's pretty okay. that's pretty perfect yeah uh, thanks for thanks so much for talking with me it was really thank you really, for reading it and for doing this it's oh really god awesome. no it was just total awesome. total pleasure okay all right see ya thanks so much Todd. <laughs>